Okay, here we are talking about our uh, final cervical pathology lecture. Uh, so let's just zip on down. Oops. We're going to be talking about bum, 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 the vascular component, the vascular. Um, and why am I bringing this up at all, right? Because this isn't some sort of uh, vascular class because of this, because of this question right here. Uh, is neck manipulation dangerous? Oh boy, I get this question all the time. And not only do I get this question, I get answers to this question from people who are telling, telling me the answer to this question one way or the other. It is or it is not dangerous, right? And uh, look, you're allowed to have your opinions. You really are. Um, I just hope that they are educated opinions, right? I find the most people I talk to uh, who are very anti-manipulation and tend to be very anti-chiropractic specifically, you know, I think that's broad and silly, right, because of this, uh, tend, to have, tend to have been educated enough to have an opinion without knowing all the facts, right? Uh, and sometimes it can be very insulting. Right when someone comes up and tells me that I'm so drastically wrong, it's like you re you realize I went to a four-year medical school to get a doctorate. Like you you think I would have looked into this just a little bit, right? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about it because it it is it is a nuanced conversation and it's hard to have, especially on a like an online forum. Oh God, you shouldn't have any questions on those, right? But uh, it is a nuanced thing, and I want you to be educated so you can answer this question because you will get this question if you are licensed to perform neck manipulations. You will get this question, and I want you to be able to answer it correctly. Whether you choose to perform neck manipulations or not is up to you, but I do think an honest answer is important, right? So a lot of this boils down to the vasculature specifically. So real quick, Arteries and veins, arteries take blood away from the heart, they go on the capillaries, and then they circle back and oh, they, I'm sorry, they, well, it goes to the lungs and then gets blood and then goes to the oxygen and, oh my God, there you, I know a whole lot about this stuff, I'm real good at it, right? No, but arteries take oxygen rich blood away, veins bring it back, uh, oxygen depleted blood back, right? So it's the, it's the cycle, the vascular cycle, right? And when we're talking about neck manipulations, we're really looking at three, two, really sort of vertebral artery, but how does the vertebral artery tie into the basilar artery? And then some people like to tie in, you're like, well, it's the neck, so the carotid arteries too. And you're like, okay, well, let's talk about those as well, right? So carotid and vertebral arteries are the, like the two or, or the, the main blood flow up into the brain. Right, and they come together and they sort of form this circle of willis and they scatter out and spread blood throughout the brain, right? Um, so yeah, these are the ones we're looking at. So primarily vertebral artery, basilar artery, or sometimes called vertebral basilar artery, and the uh, internal carotid arteries here, right? And the first thing I wanna look at is something called arterial insufficiency. So arterial insufficiency is basically a reduced or stopped blood flow. So right here we have sort of a CT with contrast in there. And on this patient's left side, the left vertebral artery here, you see a little narrowing before it forms up into the basilar artery here. So that would be a suspected arterial insufficiency, right? Why? I don't know. I don't know. But that's what we're kind of looking at here. So we're looking at two main spots, so vertebral or vertebral basilar artery insufficiency or carotid arterial insufficiency, which you can kind of see the carotid right over here too, right? So um, we're looking at signs, the, the symptoms would be something called the three Ds, or excuse me, five Ds and three Ns, right? And it's a, it's a nice little saying to remember. So dizziness, dysarthria, dysphagia, drop attack, step loquia. Right, dizziness, are they having trouble with their balance or, or focus or maintaining consciousness almost? Dysarthria, can they speak? Dysphagia, can they swallow, right? Are they having drop tax of sudden muscular weakness, right? Diplopia, do their, do, are they losing their vision or are their pupils going crazy, right? Uh, the A in an, 
again. So ataxia, so difficulty walking, walking and with balance, right? And the three ends, nausea, numbness, or nystagmus. So the guys are flitting around, they're going to throw up, and like half their face is going numb. And more. But those are just three, uh, or the, the basic five Ds and three Ns. There, it's a nice little saying to kind of remember if you're seeing these sort of symptoms, right? And then I want to also point out the difference between acute and chronic, right? Chronic uh, arterial insufficiency is generally going to be caused by atherosclerosis, so plaque buildup, right? It's a little less scary than the acute onset of 5Ds and 3Ns, right? So some sort of emergency blockage or disruption due to arterial dissection, aneurysm, embolism, slash thrombus, right? So really, the sudden versus gradual onset of some of these symptoms would be the difference on whether or not I feel it is a medical emergency, right? And the other thing I want to talk about here, we need to take a little bit of time and look at each of these because each of these examples, right, is a different pathology and, and they really, you, they all deserve their own page and deep dive and, and you'll get into that later in your education on what these are and how to respond to each of these. But just, uh, just for a little background for hearing, because I, I don't know how much you know or not, but let's, let's just dive into each of these really quickly so we understand what they are. Uh, the first one being arterial dissection. So in an artery, we have three basic layers of the outside. And what happens is you get usually some sort of damage to the, to the intimal layer here. And then the blood starts to create a little turbulent action, tends to tear it further. And then you have a dissection or separation where blood flow now flows into the medial layer of the wall of the vessel. Right? So this vessel starts to balloon out. And this can actually cause a little bit of compression all the way across this way, but it can also start to create a blood clot because the blood starts to stagnate in here, and then you get the formation of a thrombus in here, which is troublesome. Versus an aneurysm is going to be a compromise of the integrity of the vascular wall. So suddenly the pressure of the heartbeat and the blood pressure tends to push out further and further and further, and the whole artery tends to balloon out. That becomes scary uh, because uh, you, you could develop a, a thrombus again, but then we worry about a rupture, right? As this becomes this balloon just waiting to pop, right? If one of these major arteries pop, it start, you start bleeding out interstitially, right? So you're losing blood flow to very crucial areas like your brain, right? Thrombus would be a blood clot, so a formation of these uh, uh, red blood cells sticking together and platelets, right? And then an embolism would be if that blood clot then breaks loose and starts traveling along the arter arteries, right? Embolisms are scary because they can come from anywhere in the body down a big thick artery and then take a little detour down a much smaller artery and just block the whole thing up, right? Just block a whole artery up and then we're suddenly dealing with acute arterial insufficiency in a big way, right? And atherosclerosis, oh God, I hate that word, Athel atherlo that word, placking, right, builds up. That plaque can actually slowly start to occlude the vessel, but generally you're going to get the formation of a blood clot, so it's a combination of the two, which might need to lead to arterial insufficiency. So this is more of a slow process. Uh, this is going to be more of a slow, all of these are going to be a slow process with a sudden inciting incident is what we're dealing with, right? And that sudden inciting incident tends to be a stroke, a stroke. So the sudden loss of blood flow leading to cell death and infarct, right? So a lot of times when we're dealing with strokes, the majority of them are going to be ischemic strokes, ischemic type strokes, right? So a blockage versus a hemorrhagic stroke. That's gonna be a bleed out from say, um, uh, um, damage to a blood vessel or, why isn't this going back up? An aneurysm, a ruptured aneurysm, right? So with ischemic strokes, we're dealing with like a, a thrombotic. So the, the local formation of a blood clot in one of those arteries up and around the neck and, 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 and head, right? Or an embolotic uh, stroke. So that blood clot happens somewhere else in the body right? They'd you have blood clot forming down your leg and then whoop, there it goes. It's loose and it ends up in your lungs or in your brain or wherever, right? Probably not going to make it all over your brain. Um, but 
just one of the ones in the upper extremity, say, or, or right around the heart or something, and lower down in the vessel, this then loosens and then pops up into the brain, right, which creates some sort of loss of blood flow, right, versus the hem hemorrhagic stroke, right, your intracerebral brain bleeds, right, um, subarachnoid aneurysms, malformations, trauma, right, so bleeding out within the brain versus a clogged artery. Those are the, the two types of strokes we're kind of dealing with. Right, and then we have something called the transient ischemic attack. We have to talk about that for a second. So that is frequently called a TIA or a, a, a mini stroke. <clears throat> so we have a temporary disruption, right? Like this, a blood clot, uh, we're disrupted, but then it breaks down into two other pieces and, and splits up and, and goes away, right? Or that blood clot moves along, right? So transient ischemic attacks, right? A, a time-based, a temporary disruption of the blood flow, like this guy who's getting choked out right here and his tongue is lolling out. It's a very strange photo, but I love it, right? Um, or a blood clot. So it's usually defined as some sort of a stroke which resolves in less than an hour with minimal to no infarction or cell death, right? There's a the resolve. However, there's a high likelihood of a following major stroke within 24 to 48 hours, right? So, uh, Transient ischemic attack should be considered a medical emergency. You need some sort of same-day evaluation. Now, that's not a call 911 kind of a thing, but it is a very fast same-day, like we have to know right now, right? So it should be evaluated quickly to avoid a major stroke, right? Because with strokes, it's all a time game. Recovery can be very, very good if you get on top of it in time. If you don't, your function loss and your functional recovery definitely decreases, right? Another thing, I don't even know why I put this one in here, but it would be called the silent stroke or a silent cerebral infarct, an SCI. Uh, and it's different from a transient ischemic attack in that there's no symptoms, but the infarction can be extensive. So the difference here, symptoms, no real infarction, no symptoms, lots of infarction, right? So I, I think I just put the, that, this one in here to, to contrast it to you, right? So how do we diagnose this? Well, uh, <laughs> it's not easy, right? Some people say, well, look at the risk factors. And you're like, okay, well, risk factors for not just cervical region strokes, but for all strokes, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, you know, high cholesterol, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, pregnancy, smoking, estrogen-based birth controls, alcohol consumption. Well, that's a large portion of the population right there, right? So making a diagnosis based on risk factors is not great, right? And really approaching these patients with a sense of fear because they are someone on an estrogen-based birth control medication, you're gonna eliminate a lot of very viable therapies for this kind of person, right? You can also look at trends. You know, people who are older 55, biological females, right? Familial history, non-Hispanic black uh, populations or Pacific Islander. Pacific Islanders have the, one of the highest incidence rates of death associated with strokes, even though they don't have one of the highest rates of strokes, right? Uh, and then our, our local American black population, higher rates of strokes, right? And a lot of this may have to do more with health equity and, and, and access to health care as well as quality things to reduce risk factors, right? So once again, trends don't help us out a whole lot. So a lot of times the diagnoses tend to be reactive, right? We see the transient and systemic attack happening. The five Ds and three Ns are happening in an acute and or chronic way. So things we can do if we're seeing a lot of risk factors or trends, we can start reiterating the importance of diet and exercise, right? We can educate patients on that this is a potential problem, right? So as I said, generally the treatment uh, for this in acute phase, that's a medical emergency. That's 911, right? Uh, or a same day referral. So those are um, the sudden onsets. Right, chronic phase, so that would be more of that atherosclerosis, sclerosis building up. Education, education, do you have risk factors? Do you have a significant amount of risk factors, right? Let's talk about things that can mitigate and reverse the progression of these sorts of, of, of problems and pathologies, right? 
That might be as simple as education, diet and exercise or internal medications or like full blown vascular surgeons going in and, and doing things, right? So that was a little background. So back to the question, is neck manipulation dangerous if you have arterial insufficiency? So it's a little different than the original question, is neck manipulation dangerous? So is it dangerous if you have the presence of arterial insufficiency? Potentially, potentially, but it's also potentially not, right? Largely it's not, but it potentially could be. So examples that I frequently get thrown at, at me, generally pretty aggressively, right? Where chronic arterial insufficiency from plaque, they, you know, they might say, well, look, that's going to lead to inflammation, the formation of blood clot. You go in and manipulate that, you're going to create an embolism and a stroke. Okay. Another one, they have an aneurysm. Well, if you manipulate a neck with an aneurysm, you're going to rupture the artery and create a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. I hear you. Right. Uh, dissection. A dissection forming a blood clot. If you manipulate that, you create an embolism lead to a stroke. Good, 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 good. Uh, yeah, all of those are viable scenarios. However, they're extremely unlikely and they're very, or they're very extreme scenarios and they're very scary scenarios, yes. But in these examples, all of these patients are ticking time bombs, right? If, if you don't believe me, come watch me do a manipulation. They are not huge, violent things. They're generally very small, very guarded, well within a normal range of motion. So what I frequently say, if this motion was going to kill somebody, that person was going to die, right? They're ticking time bombs. There's no way we knew that was happening, right? Other than we're like, well, you should have screened. How? How? We don't have a good screening or the, the population we would have to screen would be so huge that it's unrealistic, right? These are very, very scary scenarios. And these are, these, like I said, are ticking time bombs, right? And I don't think it's fair to throw out a perfectly valid, safe therapy for fears of this. Because what you're doing here ultimately is playing a what if game, right? And you can always find an example that fits a criteria that you're looking for or some sort of extenuating circumstance. You know, like what if you, well, we should never use penicillin in case someone has a penicillin allergy. Because what if you give penicillin to someone with a penicillin allergy and they die? I'm like, yeah, that could happen. And that is scary. Anytime you do a blood draw, you could introduce an infection. And that is scary, right? You put an acupuncture needle, infection, right? What if you accidentally leave a surgical sponge in someone's abdomen? Does that mean we shouldn't use surgical sponges in surgeries or that we shouldn't do surgeries at all, right? I mean, is it possible to misdiagnose cancer, right? What are, we, what are we really scared of here? And where are the highest death rates, right? Are we picking some sort of weird extreme thing and coming down hard on a certain therapy because we don't know anything about it, right? Or is this a legitimate claim, right? I tend to lean towards the former, right? You can play this game with any therapy out there. Everything has risks. And then you go, well, risk reward. And you're like, yeah, yeah, risk reward is exactly the question, right? And the reward is pretty good, right? The, the therapeutic benefits of neck manipulation are incredible. You can get very, very good results with that, right? So let's, let's broaden this question out a little bit and say, is neck manipulation dangerous without arterial insufficiency? No. Is your answer? It's not. Right? Not if you've been trained and know what you're doing. There has been no causal relationship found in a non-pathologic neck. Right? Here's six studies, six large retrospective studies. Now, there are inherent problems with randomized controlled double-blinded testing with strokes. Right? You don't want to be subjecting patients to strokes. So we're really limited to looking at large retrospective studies large, right? I've read plenty of case reports, right? And plenty of opinion pieces, right? And plenty of, of clinical uh, experience opinions, right? That blame neck manipulations for different types of strokes. They're incredibly biased and they don't tend to have a high education in terms of what neck manipulation is and how it's performed, how it's performed correctly. 
right? So I, uh, I would say no, you know? So my answer to you, and I'm happy to have this conversation with anybody, right? I, I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and it usually involves somebody very angry yelling at me who is not willing to listen to reason. I, I get it. I get it. It's scary, right? And part of this comes down to where where did this fear come from to begin with? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting lawsuit that happened in the 80s. It was a 10-year lawsuit where... Wilk et al., so this, there's about three chiropractors who ended up suing the American Medical Association. The American Medical Association for over the course of 10 years, right? And they were able to prove that the AMA was actively suppressing the chiropractic professions uh, starting way back in the 50s and 60s. And they were they were using long-lasting sorts of uh, um, fear tactics, right? And 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 reducing uh, public trust within chiropractors, right? I mean, that's an incredible thing that, that three guys over ten years could prove that this association, who threw everything at the book, everything they could, in, including money and, and and time at these these people, they were able to stay the course and prove. That the AMA had a conspiracy where they were actively suppressing the profession. To be able to prove that of a whole association is pretty incredible. Like, that's how overt it was. But the problem is, the results were done. I mean, the fear tactic is so ingrained in a population still to this day that we still see headline news as if someone has a stroke and they were anywhere near a chiropractor. Like, oh, chiropractic stroke, there you go, that's gonna kill you. It's like, come on, right? So let's understand where some of this fear came from, and let's look at legitimate studies and look at legitimate uh, uh, results of some of these things, right? Anecdotally, one of the things I always ask people, like, are chiropractors killing people? Anecdotally, follow the money. Would insurance companies insure a profession that was actively killing people or doing something very dangerous? No, the answer is no, because they're greedy, right? So when we look at the, the malpractice insurance for surgeons, 40000 to about $200,000 a year, a year, right? Medical doctors, 8000 to $50,000 a year, depending on specialty. Chiropractors, $500 to $2,000 a year. I mean, <laughs> that is one one-hundredth of what a surgeon is. So... Oh, there you go. I mean, that's that's totally anecdotal, and I, I recognize that. But follow the money. I mean, insurance companies aren't going to insure a, a profession that is actively hurting and killing people. It's just not being shown that there's that causal relationship, right? So do you not perform neck manipulations because you are not good at it or you don't particularly like it? Sure. That's a legitimate reason not to do it. Do you not perform neck manipulations because you could kill somebody? I don't think that is an accurate statement, and I don't think that's a fair statement, right? If that's the case, then you better be giving those kind of warning signs on Advil and Tylenol and pretty much every therapy you do, right? Either do it for all or don't do it is my point, okay? Sorry, get a little, get a little headed up with this conversation just because I've had a lot of conversations with uh, surgeons and they they tend to be very angry <laughs> and, and they don't want to be wrong especially the older ones right so uh, something that can happen is something called a sympathetic res response so a post manipulative stimulation of the sympathetic system right so that can mimic signs of a stroke and that can be very very scary sometimes you'll see a spike in blood pressure uh, and a an increase of diaphoresis or an instant sweating Sometimes you become lightheaded and dizzy because there's a rush of adrenaline flowing through your thrown through your brain or your body, right? But really you're you're screening for signs of a stroke. So a sudden onset of five Ds and three Ns, right? Right away. Can you smile? Can you say your tongue? Raise both hands. Can you speak a simple sentence? Right? And then I'm gonna monitor you. The short answer is if you're scared or you're not sure, call nine one one. Don't mess around, right? Don't mess around. Most of the time, it's it's going to be a sympathetic response, right? 
So understanding what these are and furthermore having an action plan. So you don't just sit there screaming, right, or turning off the lights and running away, right? You have an action plan, right? So if it's a stroke or you suspect a stroke, 911 and start performing, performing basic life support as needed, right? Gather certain information, age, exact time, any sort of pertinent histories or medications are on, maybe take their blood pressure, right? And get ready for the paramedics and freeze in, right? Transient ischemic attack, same day referral, call their PCC, get them into an urgent care or an ER, ASAP. They have to go that day, in fact, right there, right? You might even arrange transportation for them. A family or friend, they probably should not drive themselves. Transportation service, Uber, right? Taxi, you gotta go because there is a high risk for a major event in the next 48 hours. Time is of the essence. Sympathetic response, monitor them for about 10 to 20 minutes. Use about 10 to 20 minutes. A lot of those stress hormones will start to work themselves out. Give them a light snack, a juice box, and they're good to go after that. Right, uh, at the end of the notes are all my references. You can dig through all of those. Right, as needed. I probably should have pointed those out in the other lectures, but I didn't. So there they are. They're in your lecture packet.